without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sam, our National Field Director. Thanks, Tom. So we're going to get started, and it is my pleasure this evening to have Kim Callahan here from Compassions and Choices. And this is a topic that I am very excited to be a part of presenting here at American Atheists because it's something that I have worked on personally in Maryland, and I think it's an important that's uh, an issue that's very important to our community. So I'm going to introduce her and then let her get started. Kim Callanan is the president and CEO of Compassion and Choices, where she's played a leadership role in authorizing and implementing medical aid and dying into la five new jurisdictions, drafting, promoting, and implementing Compassion and Choices' new strategic plan, and launching their Finish Strong initiatives, which includes tools designed to empower patients to take charge of the final chapter of their lives. Kim is also frequently invited to speak at conferences, testify before state legislatures, conduct policy briefings, and serve on committees in a subject matter expert on the end-of-life care options. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim, and then I'll be back, and we'll do a little bit of interview Q&A, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So with that, thanks, Kim. Great. Thank you so much um, for having me here tonight, Samantha. It really is an honor. Um, I've had the pleasure of getting to work side, uh, work alongside um, Samantha and the American Atheists uh, for the past four years in Maryland um, and really are just tremendously grateful for the partnership and the work of your organization. Um, so I wanted to start off and just talk a little bit about medical aid and dying and start out just to get a sense of um, how um, much familiarity people have with medical aid and dying. So from a show of hands, um, how many of you would say you know a tremendous amount about medical aid and dying? Um, just if you know a lot, raise your hand. I'm unmuting myself so I can give you that number because I'm not sure that you can see it. So right Great. now we have about 10% of people, oh, it's jumping. People have found where you need to raise your hand. It's over on the right-hand side of your screen, if you found it yet. It looks like we're settling at about 25% of folks. Oh, good. So about a quarter of people have a high degree of familiarity, but that means we want to be sure that um, I even playing field and give some basic information. Um, so just to start off, medical aid in dying in its simplest form, it's a medical practice that allows a person who is already going to die the option to obtain prescription medication from their doctor um, to end suffering if it becomes unbearable. And the choice is entirely theirs on whether or not they use the option. There are um, some very strict eligibility criteria um, that help to ensure that medical aid in dying protects patients um, and that nobody um, is abused uh, is, uh, and that their people are free from coercion. Um, so those eligibility criteria are a person must be an adult, um, 18 years or older. Um, you have to have a terminal illness with a prognosis of six months or less to live. So you are at the very end of your life. The question is not, um, will you die? The question is, how will you die? Um, you must be mentally capable and able to make an informed health care decision. So that is one of the core safeguards of medical aid and dying legislation. You must be acting voluntarily and you must be able to self-ingest the medication. And self-ingest, there's lots of different forms of ingestion. So it could be pushing the plunger on a feeding tube. It could be sipping a straw from a cup. Um, there's even some rectal catheters that are used. So anything that you are taking an affirmative act to demonstrate um, that is, it is you who is making this decision. Um, there are also a bunch of common regulatory requirements, and I won't go into all of them because there are a dozen. Um, the important thing to know is that when the law was first put together, everybody is understandably concerned that people would be coerced into this as an option. And so there are a whole host of requirements that help to ensure that patients are protected. What we have seen over the past five years is that this as a medical option that is recognized is really beginning to um, take, take hold. So in 2014, some of you may remember a young woman named Brittany Menard who unfortunately was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. 
She lived in California at the time, and California did not have a medical aid and dying law. And she made the decision that she was going to move from California to Oregon in order to access the Oregon Death with Dignity Act. Um, she partnered with um, my organization, Compassion and Choices, and together with her and her husband, Dan Diaz, um, we publicized um, her move from California to Oregon. And that really ignited the modern um, end of life autonomy movement and has really helped to propel the movement forward. So you'll see um, Oregon first passed the legislation in 1994, and then it took um, quite a while um, before Washington um, passed the legislation, and both of those two were by ballot initiative. We then had a court case in Montana that we won, um, and Vermont was the first state to pass through the legislature. But in 2015, right after Brittany shared her story, that was when the momentum really started to build. And we've been able to authorize um, a state a year with two states in 2019. Um, right now, one in five adults live in a state where medical aid and dying is authorized. Um, the momentum continues in the 2020 legislative session. Um, we had 20 states where there was active legislation, and we would anticipate similar numbers in 2021. Everything in 2020 came to a halt um, as a result of COVID-19, with the exception of Massachusetts that still has legislation that is active um, and has the potential to um, authorize this year. Right now, um, polling um, for this option is very high. Seven out of 10 Americans support the option, um, and that's been consistently the case um, for many, many, many years, um, and the numbers um, continue to increase um, just slightly each year. And what's noticeable is that support is high among all demographic groups. So it doesn't matter if you're talking about Democrats or Republicans, um, religious or non-religious, um, white, Americans are black, the majority support this as an option. Um, but you can see that non-religious um, are the highest supporters. So 84% of people who are not religious um, support medical aid and dying as an option. Um, support is also high among people with disabilities, which um, they often are one of the um, biggest opponents next to the Catholic Church, who is the largest opponent, opponent. but even um, people with disabilities um, support this as an option. It's consistent with their desire to have autonomy and dignity um, at the end of life. Um, We've also recently had major Latino organizations endorsing um, the National Hispanic Council on Aging, the Latino Commission on AIDS, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, and we're seeing growing support among African-American leaders. Um, two um, congressmen from Maryland, um, African-American congressmen from Maryland, the late Congressman Eliza Jum um, uh, Cummings and Anthony Brown both endorsed, um, and more recently, Dr. Jeff Gardier, who is um, a very prominent psychologist um, that is all over the media, um, has recently endorsed um, this as a, an option. We also enjoy support from the majority of doctors who do believe that this should be an option that's um, available to their patients. Um, and we're seeing as a result of the growing um, support among the American public, we're seeing growing um, support among medical uh, associ and professional associations, um, including 21 who have dropped their opposition to medical aid and dying since 2015 when Brittany first shared their story her story. Um, and you'll see that um, there are more national medical and health associations that are recognizing medical aid in dying as being distinct and different from suicide. Um, large groups like the American Public Health Association, the American Nurses Association, um, the American Medical Students Association, the American have either taken supportive positions, positions of engaged neutrality, that means that they believe that um, once something is once the law is authorized, that it is their duty to help ensure that their um, physicians know how to implement the option. And then there are several who have taken neutral positions, but all have recognized medical aid and dying as being distinct and different from suicide. Um, this is also the case among some of the leading national organizations um, that work. Um, 
around suicide. So the American Psychological Association um, indicated that medical aid in dying and suicide have profound psychological differences, and the American Association of Suicidology um, also found that medical aid in dying be, was fundamentally distinct from suicide, and they noted that the term physician-assisted suicide should be used. So the good news is that we're seeing more medical aid and dying laws being implemented across the country, and that means that we have a tremendous amount of data. We have data from um, uh, almost 10 authorized jurisdictions with a combined 50 years of experience. Um, so we now know across all of those jurisdictions that there hasn't been a single substantiated instance of abuse or misuse of the law. We know that it provides comfort and peace of mind for those terminally ill patients who decide to access the law. And we also know that it improves end-of-life care for everyone. And it does this in three primary ways. Um, it results in improved conversations between patients and providers. It results in better use of palliative and hospice care and better training for physicians on how to have end-of-life conversations that are um, to help support their patients in getting uh, having those conversations, which can sometimes be difficult. However, what we also know is that there are far too many regulatory roadblocks in the law for a dying person to be able to access, and many of those roadblocks are unnecessary and they really do impede patient choice. One of the most problematic roadblocks that we see is around notice and referral. And this is a real challenge, and it's something that I'm sure um, this community is very familiar with um, in other issues. But because of the huge and growing number of Catholic entities, um, they, of course, um, have the ability to opt out and also to not allow any of their providers to be able to participate in the practice. Um, what we're seeing, though, is it's going beyond out um, to where um, they won't even give basic information. Um, and sometimes we've heard of situations where there has been um, the withhold of information where people thought that they were going to be able to get this option and they found out at the last minute that it would not be available to them. So that is one of the most significant um, challenges that we face in implementation and something that we're going to work to um, fix both legislatively and with our continued access campaign. We did have um, a monumental moment. Um, Oregon, as I mentioned earlier, was the very first state to pass the law um, and recognized that the law as is has too many unnecessary regulatory roadblocks. And in 20, they passed a very slight modification to the law that waived the waiting period, allowed doctors to waive the waiting period for individuals who are unlikely to survive during that time period. There is a 15-day waiting period that somebody has to wait, um, and now in Oregon, a doctor has the ability to waive this. And this is really key because um, about a third of patients were dying during that waiting period, and so they were never able to get the autonomy and the dignity and the compassion that they were seeking. Instead, their final moments were spent suffering, unable to access an option that they legally had a right to. Um, and that's kind of an overall, um, one of the things that was to um, let folks know how it was that they could get involved in our efforts. And so on our website, under Take Action, you will see um, that um, there's a sign up to volunteer place. Um, and if you hit that, um, we have activity across the country and would certainly welcome your participation. And then, of course, I'm sure um, there will be uh, partnerships taking place with American Atheists and you could volunteer directly back. So thank you so much. And I will now turn things back over to Samantha. Great. Excellent. Thank you for that. Quick rundown for people who weren't uh, completely familiar with it. So that's great. So about three quarters of our folks weren't familiar. So hopefully they will be now, right? Um, and so I know that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about after having been to hearings in Maryland, as I mentioned at the beginning, several years in a row now, um, sitting there listening for hours and hours to testimony on the opposite side, you mentioned that 
the main opposition is from the Catholic Church and other religious organizations, but mostly the Catholic Church. And I'm wondering if you can describe um, what that opposition looks like and what steps you guys have taken to be able to combat it as an organization and how successful or frankly unsuccessful um, those yeah. efforts have been. Yeah, that's great, Samantha. And you're right, um, it's the Catholic Church. Um, and then in some states, it's evangelical Christians. Those are the two religious entities that tend to um, most actively get involved in the legislative efforts. Um, and, um, you know, their opposition is strong, as I'm sure you have experienced across a host of issues. They have um, a very powerful lobby. Um, I can't even calculate the um, how much larger they are than us, but it is significant. Um, and then, of course, they have the ability to preach from the pulpit. It's always carrying a whole host of issues and so it can very easily organize um, and um, it's always harder to pass something than it is to defeat something and so we are coming from a place where it just takes far more resources and efforts to con convince lawmakers to do anything and of course we're also competing with a host of other issues um, so it is a challenge um, for sure um, I will say we have had um, some real success, and I would um, look at the um, five states that we um, authorized in, or six states that were authorized in the last five years, uh, all as evidence of the success and evidence that you can defeat um, the power of the Catholic Church lobby um, through persistence and resilience and, frankly, the resources. Um, and we have lots of examples of that. And I'll talk about a legislative example of sort of what that looks like, and I'll talk about the ballot initiative. Um, so I would say right now that if we had, um, we were, we had millions of dollars, we could go to ballot initiative in just about any state and we would win, as long as we had equal or near equal resources to the Catholic Church. Like, People want this as an option, but um, we have to be able to compete with the slander that they put forth and the misinformation that they put out. In Colorado, after we had won in California through the legislature, we made the strategic decision that we needed to go to ballot initiative in Colorado in order to be able to demonstrate that the American public wanted this option. And the last ballot initiative in Massachusetts, which we did not run, but um, was unfortunately, was they lost narrowly. And that was um, really a black mark over the movement because it was lawmakers would use it as an excuse and say, look, when we put it in front of the people, they didn't want it. But the reality was that they were outspent by so much that um, they just didn't have um, the ability to overcome that. So we decided we were gonna go to ballot in Colorado. And I remember our very first planning meeting, we said, we're not just gonna win, we're gonna walk. And that was our goal. We wanted to send a very clear message. Fortunately, um, and I should say, um, Compassion and Choices did some of the early work, and then the Compassion and Choices Action Network, which is our sister organization, provided about $5 million of funding into the ballot committee that was eventually set up. And we ended up winning in Colorado by two thirds of the vote. We actually outspent the opposition and we outmaneuvered them every single step of the way. Um, and we were just clearly on the right side of the issue. And that sent a really powerful message. Um, so really what you need in order to beat the Catholic Church is resources. So that's, if you have the resources and you can spend more resources than they are and you have the right message, which we do, um, we can win. We don't have those kind of resources everywhere. So then we had to get a little bit smarter and more sophisticated because um, we can't spend $5 million everywhere. Um, unless somebody on this call is a millionaire and wants to do it, we could give, we could both take the money. We could do some amazing things. Um, so in the legislature, it gets a little bit more challenging. And what we have found to be one of the most effective ways to um, defeat the Catholic Church is two things. The first is the power of the personal story. Um, people really do um, relate to individuals who are terminally ill and are sharing their story and what they want, and it's incredibly compelling. And so the more individuals who are courageous enough and um, compassionate enough to spend those final months of their life testifying, 
it is um, transformational in terms of our ability to get legislation passed. Um, the second thing that we've also done is um, we've organized other religious entities that are supportive to demonstrate that while the Catholic Church might be opposed to it and evangelicals might be opposed to it, it's not that all religious groups are opposed. And so that, you know, is important. And then, of course, Samantha, you have been um, and other um, others and atheist groups across the country have also been really important partners to us in testifying and helping to deliver the message and making sure that all voices are being heard. And that definitely has made a difference. Yeah, and I think from a, a personal sort of story is that, um, you know, I went and did lobby day and I got all but thrown out of a legislator's office for um, being there to lobby because his staffer told me that he was Catholic and that he would never, ever vote yes in the state of Maryland on this law. Um, and so, you know, obviously our concern here is that separation of religion and government. And I'm not going to, we're never going to reach a, a, a representative like that. But I also find that um, locally educating people, and I already see some Q&A questions from the audience that I'm going to leave, but educating people on what the process actually looks like and what this is and what it isn't, um, yeah. because people have some really strange ideas about yeah. what this law actually enables people to do. Well, and something that might be interesting to this group um, is, first of all, seven out of 10 Catholics themselves support the option. So it really, it's controversial among, you know, in the pulpit and among priests, but it's in the Pope, but it's not controversial to the average Catholic. They overwhelmingly support the option. And interestingly, in New Jersey, our bill sponsor, the majority leader in the Senate side and the House side, both bill sponsors and the, gover and the governor were all Catholics. And all of them ended up being strong advocates and supporters of the option. So it is possible to move um, even a Catholic, not all Catholic lawmakers, but some of the Catholic lawmakers um, to the right side. Yeah. And so in that same kind of line of questioning about uh, opposition, I know that it's an issue in a lot of the issues that we sort of pay attention to at American Atheists is that even once you get that law passed, it has to, and you touched on this, that it then needs to be implemented in that state. And we have these huge Catholic healthcare systems now in the United States that don't want to provide services to people for lots of various things, but this is one of those things on that list. And so are there things we can do about that? How do we try to solve that problem? Or is it just in, in not solvable at this point? Well, I wouldn't say it's not solvable um, uh, because you know social change doesn't happen if you if you give up, but it's definitely a challenge. So the first thing that we have to do is make sure that we get every secular health system on board, um, and that's critical because if we have um, barriers among the secular systems and among the Catholic systems, and right now there are barriers to both, um, we've got to open up access among the secular systems and among more doctors. So we're doing a lot of provider education, continuing medical education. We're actually getting ready to, to work with Medscape on a CME. Um, there's lots of other entities, medical, um, like the City of Hope has really taken on end of life care in general, and they're doing a lot of work around um, medical education. So um, helping to see um, health systems take on the education themselves and um, making sure that the secular systems are doing more is really key. Um, but we're also going back in and we're looking at the legislation and we're figuring out how do we ensure that we strengthen the um, the notice and the referral um, and, and make sure that patients are getting honest information. So, for example, Washington State in the last election cycle, the last um, legislative session, um, had a bill that was making its way through that required hospitals to report their medical aid and dying policy to the Department of Health, who was then going to publicize it and promote it on their website. That's tremendous because right now what happens is people don't actually understand when they go to the Catholic health system that their wishes aren't going to be honored or respected. And by the time they figure it out, it's too late. And so if we could um, get, get laws like that passed and if we can ensure that the patients are getting on this information. I always think about the fact that, well, my gosh, like cigarettes got have warning labels on it. Why can't Catholic health systems have warning labels on it? And so those are the kinds of things that we're exploring and we'll have to 
um, sort of see what happens in terms of our ability to implement one of them. And hopefully you guys will partner with us on that as well. I was about to say, we actually already have model legislation, um, a Patient Right to Know Act that we've tried to get introduced in a couple different states, including Maryland. So we will partner on that. We'll, we'll talk right. about that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, that sounds yeah. tremendous. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that we've pretty much covered it, but I get this question a lot. And so I want to just make sure that we really connect the dots for people about why atheists and secular organizations should care deeply about this issue. We get a lot of times where we do these sort of webinars and people are like, well, this isn't really a church state issue. And so I just wanna make sure that we are um, connecting those dots for folks and sort of get your take on that. Yeah, um, I would say it's definitely a um, church state issue um, and it's a church state issue where we're making progress. Um, if you think about the impact that Catholic healthcare has on um, the delivery of care, not just at the end of life, but you know the beginning of life as well. Um, we are. Um, it is definitely an issue where um, your rights are being are, are not being honored um, because religion is um, dictating a policy. And if you um, took the religion out of it and allowed people to have the full range of end of life options, medical aid and dying would be a law everywhere. Um, so I do see it very much as an issue, um, and, it, it, and we see support from a lot of the secular groups and atheists, you know, across the country, um, because it really, um, it really is about um, Catholic values, evangelical values, dictating the kind of health care that somebody should get, is allowed to get, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> and that again, going back to educating people, right? It doesn't mean it because this law is available to you, it yeah. does not in any way, shape, or form mean that you have to avail yourself of it. And so making sure that people understand that it's not that people are going to come and enforce this law upon them. It's just adding another choice in a wide host of types of choices that you need to make at end of life. Um so my next sort of question, and I'm also gonna put in a part of it, is that you guys have done at Compassionate Choices, I think, a really, really, really impressive job of reaching out to faith leaders and communities of color and LGBTQ groups and talking to them and getting those audiences uh, more engaged in this conversation and in this fight. And you put up a slide that said that 84% of non-religious people are in support of this law. Um, but, you know, as the National Field Director for American Atheists, I can tell that there's a long history of people making the joke about herding cats when you're talking about trying to do stuff in the atheist organization. So I would love to know what sort of things we can plan together to reach out to the atheist and humanist communities and engage them in that same way. And then of course, what we can do to help with that. Um, but I do wanna say that one of the things that I thought was great this last session in Maryland was you had an interfaith thing. And um, uh, Donna Smith reached out to me and said, can you come and talk at it? I happened to be out of town. And so I contacted um, Fred Edwards, who's a humanist celebrant and had him come and speak at that. And I thought it was really wonderful to um, have that different voice in the room and so that was fantastic um so are there more plans for that kind of thing is there what can we do to help sort of what direction do we go from here i guess well first of all we're delighted that you want to help and you've been such a tremendous help in maryland and um and i know in other states and hopefully some of the people on the call today will be inspired and they'll they'll also want to help because the only way that we make progress is really by um, groups like yours and ours coming together and figuring this out so um so thank you first of all um we are actually this uh last fiscal year which started july 1st so our next fiscal year um, we were prioritizing growing our faith outreach work. So the um, what Donna did in Maryland was almost like a pilot for us where we were trying to see, we did it in Maryland and New York that year and I think one other state. 
Um, and um, it was our pilot to see is that kind of a model something that's successful? Does it result in um, bringing voices together? Can we make it happen? And it worked really well, as, as you noted. So we are expecting to do more of that across the country in some of the key target states. Um, and some of our ability to do that is really about what partners were able to um, work with in those states. So if there were places that you have stronger networks or are more available, if we kind of were to share that information together, that would help us know where it's possible to be able to do something like that. Um, so we have a, a faith advisory council um, that has um, that's all together. Um, and um, I hadn't I don't know if they had thought of the idea of having um, and if you would want to be a part of a faith advisory council. There's always this. I think I always think of atheists as not a faith, but. Um, <laughs> You could also argue the flip, I guess, that um, it is a faith, it's a different faith. And so like you could join our faith advisory council and make sure that the atheist, atheist voice is represented as a part of that, if that felt appropriate to you. Um, and for sure, I mean, we're, we're, we've got about 12 states that we anticipate legislation will be um, act, uh, active to authorize. And then in all of the authorized states, we also have efforts underway um, in order to do implementation in those states. And in some of them, we're anticipating legislation to improve the law. So um, we probably have 20 or so states that um, are good opportunities for collaboration. And I would imagine that they overlap a lot with where your network is. Probably. If you're, mm -hmm. if you're thinking you can get laws passed in those particular states, then probably. <laughs> Yeah, we have activists there. And so that takes me to my next question is um, sort of specifically how to organize and what groups we pull in. Uh, and, and you know, I, I have certainly my ideas of, of what has worked in Maryland in terms of, of what that process looks like as a volunteer. Um, so I don't know if you want to outline that a little bit more in terms of what people can do. Um, sure. You know, I mean, obviously, I've been through Maryland. If there's different states that are doing different things that I wouldn't be aware of, the sort of process of sign up to volunteer, then what? What happens? Yeah. So there's a whole host of different opportunities, depending on how somebody wants to volunteer and whether the state is authorized or not authorized and where you are in the cycle. So um, and what your kind of preferences and skills are. So some people like to volunteer around the legislation and, and the lobbying and the advocacy piece. Um, and there's a host of different things that you can do. And it's pretty much like any organizing campaign. So you can testify um, when there are hearings. Um, you can um, contact um, and do organizing and join. Like we have what are called action teams and they're local, local volunteer teams where people join together and they organize other volunteers and they do public education presentations. So um, in some states, um, individual people will get trained on the issue and then they're going out and training other people um, or, or, or talking about the issue to try to garner more support. Um, you can do lobby days. We have lots of lobby days where you um, go to the lobby day and it's, I'm sure, like the same lobby days that you do for other issues and, you know, walk around and do some talking. Um, you could organize your members, um, especially if they overlap in targeted districts where we need to move people. Um, some of our super volunteers will even, even call into our supporters in the districts that are targeted to try to get those people to contact, you know, and call their members. Um, so there really is a host of ways to um, get involved around the legislative advocacy efforts. Um, we do uh, events. So, you know, the faith event that you just talked about, that would be another way to get involved. And it's everything from, you know, you um, as the person who actually spoke, but then there's also the behind the scenes um, people who are helping to organize it and call volunteers and hold signage and, you know, copy and collate and all of that. Um, of course, the next legislative session, um, it will be interesting to see what happens. Um, we are, um, our, our issue often attracts an older population. And so um, the idea of anything in person that would put somebody um, at risk is um, of course concerning. And so I'm really interested to see 
um, you know, all of our organizing right now is taking place online. And it'll be interesting to see kind of how things shape up in the fall and what the next legislative session looks like. And we're, you know, doing a lot of what I'm sure you guys are doing, which is, you know, really trying to weigh the benefits and the burdens and the options and making sure that you're doing everything you possibly can in, a, in this new digital environment. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I know we're exploring a lot of digital advocacy models and, you know, virtual hearings and those kinds of things. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. And then one of the most powerful things that somebody can do is be a storyteller. So obviously you can go and represent just the, the position of an atheist, but if you happen to yourself be at the end of life or know somebody or caring for somebody who is, the most powerful stories and the ones that get picked up in the media um, are those people that, um, themselves want the option. And so if you fall in that category and are willing to, are courageous enough to do that, um, we do give you training and help make sure you're comfortable and all of that. Um, and some people choose to do it, but they're only comfortable submitting an op-ed or a letter to the editor and other people are more comfortable you know, sharing their story, either testifying before the state legislature or going on camera. Um, so those are kind of a host of ways. And then, of course, there's letters to the editor um, that can go into local papers, and that's another opportunity. Did I miss anything, Samantha, any ways that you got involved that I missed? No, I think that pretty much covered it. Um, it you know, I mean, I, I, we've done other trainings on lobbying for our folks, and, and people can find some more specifics about that. But I, I do want to say that you guys run an excellent lobby day, and so if people are stressed out about they haven't gone to lobby before, you you guys have a really great um, setup where you come in and you're trained for a half a day and you go in over the pack, the talking points and so you know what you're gonna say and you're set up with somebody who has lobbied on the issue before, hopefully. Um, so if it is your first time lobbying and you, and you feel kind of hesitant to do it, uh, it's a really well-run, system that you guys have put together. And so it's very easy to just step in and say, this issue is important to me and here's why. Um, and I encourage people, if you are from our community, I know in other communities as well, I know that I saw people, you know, that if they were LGBTQ, they'd have a pin. If they were humanist, they'd have a pin. They have on top of the yellow and blue compassion and choices so that you can say, I'm here, I'm a constituent, I'm also an atheist, or I'm also a humanist, or I'm also whatever. Um, and so I encourage people to to do that so that you're getting both sides of your voice heard um, in that. And uh, yeah, and, and the sharing of stories I think is very important. Um, I mean, you know, one of the other things that we do for our volunteers, we have volunteer state directors who will go and testify on behalf of American atheists in different states. And we write that testimony for them, but I always tell them to pretty much cross out all of the legally legislative language that's going to get submitted because you only have three minutes right so that will get submitted in writing and to add in why it's important to them um, on a personal level whether it's a loved one that died or the choice being taken away or in my case i worked as a certified nurse's aide all through college and watched a lot of really long drown out horrible not fun deaths um, and so people should have the option but I think that we are definitely in a space where we can um, get people interested in this. We have a bunch of questions coming in and I am hoping that Tom has got his audio issues worked out. He was having a little bit of a delay problem there. Um, so Tom, if you wanna come back in, I wanna be able to get to as many of these questions that I see coming in as we can. Yes, and we, we have quite a few. If you do have any more questions, please feel free to use the chat box and just send them to me. Um, a lot of the questions have dealt with eligibility and access to medical aid in dying, um, including uh, one person asked, what is the best way to access a list of supportive physicians in a particular state? That's a great question. So um, we don't keep a list of supportive physicians because ultimately what we're trying to do is to integrate medical aid and dying into standard care so that people are able to go to their own doctor and um, be able to um, get the option. What we found is that um, what we heard from the um, leaders of the um, abortion movement was don't make the mistake that we made. You know, um, it became a separate standalone practice and it is always under attack. 
So learn from our mistake and integrate it and make it so that someone can go to their family physician and they can get this option. And so that's what we're really working to do. Um, so for people who want the option, um, we coach you on how to talk to your doctor about it. And then we have a, um, our doctor, our national medical director who will talk to your doctor about it. And if your doctor says no, we have a list of supportive facilities and then we help you kind of um, go through the option. And for people who get to the very end, um, if they can't find someone, we'll work with them. But what we really wanna do is use the power of advocacy and the patient to get more doctors to be willing to practice. And in uh, states where people don't have access yet, are they able to easily travel to other states and get it there? That's a, a tough question. So I wouldn't say easily. Um, really, um, unless you know in advance that this is an option that you would want and you move pretty early on, um, it's difficult to do. There are residency requirements. Um, it's not particularly difficult to establish residency, but for most people, by the time they get to the very end of their life, um, they, um, you know, the idea of picking up and moving and going to another state and reestablishing residency and finding two doctors who are going to support you, it's really um, not very doable. So there are a handful of people who've done it. So Brittany Menard obviously successfully did it. If I look at the people that I know who've done it, it's been relatively few and they have been younger. So even though they were terminally ill, um, their, uh, the rest of their body was not yet, you know, sort of declining. And so they had more energy and they were really clear from the outset that that was what they wanted. If you sort of figure it out later on in the process, it would not be possible. So our goal is to make sure that there's access in every state. And that's the strategy that we're working towards. Um, and we're kind of making our way through the West Coast. And now we're making our way through the East Coast and we got to help in the middle of the country. There is, a, a, in addition to uh, questions of geography, there's also a question about um, particular conditions people have. Um, one person asked um, or said, we find many suffering people are ex presently excluded from the law due to MS, ALS, Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson's. Do you see a future for these folks? Um, so I would put them in different categories. Um, so, um, uh, the people who have like ALS, it's a misnomer that they're excluded from the law. Um, anybody who is able to take any act, um, if they are mentally competent, um, is able to um, access the option. So many, if you look at the stats on who uses the law, ALS is the second highest um, people who use the law. Um, they tend to be able to either use a feeding tube or um, through a straw, but um, doctors, you know, ALS actually they are using the law. So um, that's kind of a, a, a misnomer. Um, but in terms of dementia and um, people who don't have mental capacity, um, really the core safeguard that we hear that is most important um, within, you know, to our lawmakers is the mental capacity. It is what gives them the comfort of knowing that it is the person and that abuse and a coercion is not going to take place. And that's also what we hear from communities of color, for people with disability, that that is the core and most important safeguard. Um, so there are options though for people who don't want to suffer with dementia. We have a wonderful dementia values and priorities tool on our website. It allows you to document the point at which you would want to forego treatments and you can cut years off of the length of time that you suffer with dementia. So if your concern is dementia and mental competency, I would strongly encourage you. It's called our Dementia Values and Priorities Tool, and I would encourage you to check that out. Kim, uh, you just mentioned mental capacity, uh, capability. W one person actually just asked, how is mental capability assessed? Uh, so there's two physicians who have to determine uh, mental capacity. Um, and it's just a conversation with the doctor and the doctor is assessing whether or not you understand um, the ramifications of your decision. So do you understand that when you take this medication that you're going to die and that will be the end? If they have concerns that you don't understand it, um, then they refer you to a, um, for a mental health evaluation and that's a psychiatrist um, 
uh, or a um, therapist in some states is a social worker. It's a little different depending on the state, um, but then they will do an assessment. And if they, they ultimately have to clear you and say, um, yes, you know, this person has capacity if the doctors are not um, able to deem that. Um, one other person asked, does hospice offer this where it's legal? This is a great question. So it depends on the hospice. Um, you may know that hospice originally came out of Catholic health care. So 40% uh, of hospices are Catholic and are um, the ethical and religious directives of Catholic health care um, govern them. So those hospices do not honor it. Um, and then we work as a part of our access campaigns to ensure that as many of the secular hospices as possible adopt supportive policies. Um, and many do, but some still don't. That one of the fundamental premises that hospice was founded on was that you wouldn't hasten death. And so it's taking some time in the same way it's taking lawmakers getting comfortable with this idea. It's taking time for providers and doctors to get comfortable. But we are seeing an increasing number of hospices adopting supportive policies and more and more doctors being willing to practice. So I think it'll be similar to the kind of change you saw in the childbirth movement, where it used to be that the only sort of thing that was accepted was this idea that, you know, the doctor would make all the decisions on behalf of the, the, the mother and, um, you know, there was little control and you saw a shift take place where all of a sudden, you know, partners were in childcare delivery rooms and women were saying, no, I don't want medication. So that's the kind of shift that medical aid and dying is help to, helping to create at the end of life. So it's slow, but we're seeing that shift, and I think it will continue where eventually you're going to see more hospices, um, or the majority of secular hospices adopting supportive policies. Great. Um, now there are quite a few questions about the Catholic Church. Uh, <laughs> as can be expected, since we're a bunch of atheists. Uh, the question is, what is the biggest, quote, reason the Catholic Church uses to fight against this? Um, they are ethically and morally opposed to it because um, of the sanctity of life. Okay. Um, a few more questions about Catholics, um, and specifically the Supreme Court. I'm guessing this is uh, specifically after uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, right, um, what five, uh, sorry, with five times as many Roman Catholics on the Supreme Court as there are Roman Catholic adults in, in the US, is there concern the Jewish judiciary will further interfere with individual rights in this regard? That is a great question. Um, and um, without really a great answer. Um, so yes, we are you know, always concerned about what's gonna happen. We do have a benefit with our issue um, in that it went to the Supreme Court 20 years ago, and what the Supreme Court came back and said was that um, they would leave it to the states to decide and that the la there would be a laboratory of states. And so they didn't at that time say it wasn't allowed. What they said at that time was, this isn't a, a question for the courts, this is a question for the states to decide by passing legislation. And that's exactly what we've done. Now, at that time, none of the Supreme Court justices were on our side. So actually, as public opinion has grown over the years, I suspect now some of those people who voted no would now vote yes, um, that this should you know, be allowed um, and should be a right. And they didn't vote that it wasn't. They just voted it wasn't a constitutional right. Um, so on the one hand, we're in um, a better position than like um, a woman's right to choose where it was a constitutional right and then there's a chance of taking it away. We never had it as a constitutionally protected right. We were told, go legislate it, and that's what we've been doing. And so as we've legislated it, it's forced us to gain public support and to do that hard work and to gain support among the lawmakers. So in that regard, it would be hard for me to imagine that the courts could come and find all of a sudden these state laws to be unconstitutional because it would be counter to everything that has just been done and to you know, a whole host of precedents. But they could continue to um, make it difficult around referrals and the more they protect 
uh, religious freedom and the rights for, you know, for health systems, not just health systems as entities, but the doctors within those his health systems to be forbidden to do things, the more they can impede the ability to implement access. Um, so, um, so the answer is, I'm not, I, yes, we're worried, but maybe not as worried as otherwise we could be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, speaking of the rise of support for medical aid in dying, um, one person wants to know what are the next steps, oh, sorry, states likely to pass the bills? Um, great question. So um, let's see. Um, Massachusetts, hopefully, if you guys um, are working, doing work in Massachusetts, please tell us now because uh, Massachusetts is the only state that still has a chance of passing in 2020. Um, and so, um, so hopefully Massachusetts. Um, uh, there's also good possibilities. We're not giving up in Maryland. We are going to make it happen, Samantha. Um, so Maryland, Nevada, New Mexico, um, Delaware. Um, who am I missing? Um, we've got good efforts in Illinois. They're still kind of early um, in Minnesota. And we have a competition going between Illinois and Minnesota on who will be the first Midwest state. Um, so we'll see. Um, but the two of them are doing some really good work at organizing. Um, Sounds like we're looking at Virginia a little bit more now too, since Virginia, everything. Yes, thank you, Samantha. Yeah, yeah, Virginia is, is back on the list this time. Um, so I think, I'm sure I forgot somebody, but those are the ones that are coming to mind. And we did send out an action alert in Massachusetts. And of course, oh. we got some good responses from that. Thank you, yeah. Um, fingers crossed in Massachusetts. It's my home state, so. Oh. <laughs> but you live in Maryland, right? Yeah, I'm in Maryland now. Um, we, got, we have a few questions from individual states, but the one that kept coming up the most is Florida. What, one person among others wrote, we have quite a few people here in Florida. Could you talk about Florida in particular? We are full of seniors who deserve this right. You are absolutely full of seniors who deserve this right. And we actually um, started organizing. That was one of the very first decisions to two and a half years ago, I became the president and CEO. I had been the chief program officer. Um, and one of the very first decisions I made was to grow a campaign in Florida. Um, we are, however, in Florida taking a slightly different approach. Um, uh, unfortunately, the Florida legislature is full of evangelicals. It is one of the um, very, very difficult states, as I imagine you guys come up against this all the time. Um, so we don't think um, doing a legislative approach in Florida is going to be the most effective to start. We want to organize instead around health systems. Um, right now, as I mentioned earlier, everybody does have a legal right to forego medical treatments and pre-document them if they have dementia but very few health systems are recognizing this. Um, and there's a huge outcry for this in Florida. So we wanna try to organize and get health systems to adopt supportive policies in honoring and respecting existing legal rights um, so that um, we're kind of warming up the medical system for when medical aid and dying is eventually implemented. We're actually doing the sort of implementation campaign that we run after a medical aid and dying law is passed in Florida around dementia. It will allow us to build support among doctors and the medical community and the general public um, and kind of do some of that important groundwork. Um, and then as we grow some of that support, we will keep monitoring the legislature um, and then begin to do some more legislative advocacy. There was a bill last year in Florida, but it was it was dead on arrival. Like it is just such a hard state. I don't know, Samantha, if you guys have had luck on any issue in Florida. It's a really hard state. No, I mean we have we have some really great advocates in Florida and a very active group down there. Um, and one of the other things, of course, that we watch is Project Blitz bills, and so we're constantly opposing Bible and classes and schools and, and God we trust laws and, and all sorts of nonsense down there. So it, it would be a hard, it would be a hard state <laughs> to, to do anything legislatively, I think. We do dream of a ballot initiative in Florida. Um, it, it, unfortunately, it's one of the states that requires, is it 67% of the vote? It's, it's higher than most states, or maybe it's not that high, 60%. It's a higher percentage than just the majority. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, but actually, I think we could get there. 
Um, I don't think it's out of the range of possibilities. It's just super expensive. So we don't have the resources to be able to do it. And we would never take on a campaign without having the right amount of resources. But I hope I keep hoping one day I'm going to open up our mailbox and there's going to be a legacy gift from somebody and then I'm going to be able to do my. <laughs> and I, I think it's important for people to understand here the the process that happens when you start working in a state. Right. So, I mean, we've already mentioned that I testified four years in a row is the 10th year last year, I think ninth or 10th year that it had been introduced, though. In Maryland, in Maryland, if I remember correctly. Maryland is like five, five or six years. Five or six, okay. So, but then, but if we could kind of like go through what that process looks like, because sure. I think people sometimes think when we're working on issues like this that you introduce the bill and it comes to a vote and then it's done. So, oh, Samantha, wouldn't that be so nice? Yeah, great. Um, so, um, unfortunately, and every state is a little bit different. So, every state's process is a little bit different. But, um, there are thousands and thousands, there are thousands of bills that get introduced in most states. Um, and the introduction of the bill um, is kind of the first hurdle. So getting introduced, getting the bill to be introduced is typically not the challenge. You can typically find someone to introduce the bill. It's getting the bill to actually be heard and to be considered a priority of leadership that is the challenge. And you know, they have thousands of different issues that they're dealing with. It's even harder right now because you have, you know. COVID-19 specific things that they're trying to address. You have um, the racial justice issues that are, are popping up. You've got budgetary constraints. So you're competing against all the normal issues. Plus now we're gonna be competing against these special issues. Um, and so you've gotta, um, you've gotta get to the point where you're generating enough support that you have people in a leadership role who are willing to sponsor the bill and then, and then who are willing to really advance it. And if you end up with a bill sponsor that has no clout, it's just, it's not even worth the time or the effort. And then if you go forward and you move legislation before you're really ready and it gets heard and you don't have good media support and good turnout and good storytellers and it gets covered poorly and the lawmakers don't hear the right messages, it actually sets you back. So it's similar to that ballot initiative in Massachusetts that I talked about by losing that that set the issue back. And so you don't really want your issue um, to move forward prematurely. Now, every state's a little bit different. So in some states, if you move the legislation um, before it's ready, it's really considered a setback if you don't like sort of advance to a particular point. In other states, um, they expect you to kind of bring it forward each year and that's just part of what the process is. And so you really do need to defer to the local experts and in the states that we're, where we really feel like there's possibility after all the grassroots, the volunteers have been built up, all of that stuff happened, you really do wanna have a lobbying firm because they are the ones that are able to help you figure out kind of the ins and outs and play the politics. Um, and then the other challenge is you don't want to move a bill and end up with a bad bill and this is what almost happened to us in Maryland but they had gotten enough pressure that they wanted to lawmakers wanted to move the bill forward but one of the people who was in leadership was working with the opposition and introducing amendments that were being accepted that was going to make the bill not just inaccept inaccessible but impossible like it was so it's already so hard for a dying person to get through this process and they added 19 amendments on top of the bill and the amendments were so egregious that nobody was going to be able to access the options immunities doctors didn't get immunities and patients had to have three doctors and those three doctors couldn't work in the same health system so you couldn't be at like John Hopkins health system and have any of those three doctors work there. I mean, it was ludicrous. So it would have been a disservice to actually let that bill go through because the experience a dying person would have would be to have a false expectation, a false hope raised and then never get through the process. So you also have to really know that you have people that are going to advocate for a good bill in leadership positions or you could end up in a really bad position. Yeah, and in that case, you guys actually sort of pulled your support at the last minute, and we were like, 
never mind. <laughs> we'll try again next year. <laughs> and so we were actually, I think it, it lost by one vote, right? And we were actually happy that it, it didn't get passed. So um, yeah. interesting ins and outs of, of how things work. Speaking of uh, getting bills passed, um, a few people have asked about uh, the, how much influence the medical insurance industry has on medical aid and dying. Um, another person actually asked about whether uh, medical insurance is willing to cover this. Those are great questions. So I, we don't see the medical insurance industry playing or involved in any way whatsoever. Um, the, pe the people who choose this option, they're already gonna die. 90% of them are on hospice care. Um, and most of them hang on to the medication until the very, very last minute. So when a study was done around, it was actually done by Ezekiel Manuel, who is not supportive of the option. They came out and found that um, it really is not a huge cost savings. People are taking it just at the very, very end. It's cutting a couple of days off of their life. So um, the insurance industry has not played an active role. And the opposition will often say that the insurance industry is behind this and pushing it and they're funding it. And I'm like, could someone give me some of that money? Because I don't have any of it. Um, they've never given me a penny. Um, uh, so, uh, so do they cover it? Um, that is a great question. Maybe something else we could partner on one day would be the removal of the Assisted Suicide Funding Restriction Act, which is a federal law that makes it so that federal funds are not allowed to be used to pay for medical aid and dying. And um, so it cannot be covered through Medicare since Medicare is a federal program. It is covered um, in many of the states through state Medicaid, if there is a separate funding stream, most of the states have um, agreed to cover it. And most private insurance has ended up agreeing to cover it. So the vast majority of private insurance. At one point, um, the cost had skyrocketed up to about $5,000 for the prescription. Um, but fortunately, um, and that was, this tells you, that was in response to um, winning California, the demand goes up. So actually the cost should go down, um, but you know, there was one really good protocol. And um, I think that it was all the opposition working to try to make it inaccessible. Fortunately now other protocols have been, um, have been um, developed. And so um, you can typically get the option for four or $500 and most private insurances are covering it. There's actually another question on insurance, but a different type, life insurance. Um, one person wrote, for family breadwinners who have life insurance policies to take care of their families when they pass, will their policies pay out if they use the medical aid and dying option in states where it's an option? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, written into the law is that medical aid and dying is not suicide um, and that insurance companies are not allowed to use this as a reason not to um, pay out on an insurance policy. So we have never heard of a situation where an insurance company um, tried not to pay out. Um, it would be illegal for them to do that. And if that were to happen, that would be a court case we would gladly take on. So you just call us up and, and we will defend you on that one. I mean, it's black and white in the law, so it wouldn't go very far and it would likely be settled in a, in a matter of minutes. Um, you just said that medical aid in dying uh, is not a suicide, and you, you said that also in your presentation. But to go back to basics, a few people had questions about terminology specifically, which ones, which words to use: physician-assisted suicide, death with dignity, someone throughout euthanasia, uh, which go back to like the 90s. Can you explain all the differences and so people know which words to use and which not? Yeah, those are those are great questions. Okay, so. Medical aid in dying is when a person is terminally ill and they are able to self-ingest the medication and they're making the decision themselves. Um, it is distinct from euthanasia, which is when a third party is performing the act on somebody else. One of the things that became very clear here in the United States was that the idea of a third party performing the act on somebody was very uncomfortable for doctors, was very uncomfortable for lawmakers, it was not politically feasible. And so the idea that the person has to be able to self ingest is core and fundamental. And that's what distinguishes medical aid and dying from euthanasia. And it's what makes it politically um, feasible here in the United States. Um, the opposition will often refer to medical aid and dying as assisted suicide and suggest that they are the same things. 
the medical aid and dying laws actually say that they are two entirely different things. Medical aid and dying is when a person is already going to die, they're terminally ill and they go through the process, whereas assisted suicide is when you're assisting somebody who is, you know, not terminally ill um, and, you know, and um, in, you know, in the act. And so those two things are, are different. And of course, the difference between medical aid and dying and suicide is that with medical aid and dying, the person's already going to die and they're making a very rational decision that they don't want to suffer. Whereas with suicide, the person has a mental health condition. Um, they're not acting rationally. They're not going to die. Um, and through treatment, um, they could be helped and they could live potentially a long and productive life. So those are the distinctions between the two. Um, in terms of death with dignity versus medical aid in dying, in the early days, um, it used to be referred to as death with dignity. And that's, of course, what the Oregon law, the Washington law, the DC law are called. As we started to advance um, across the country and really needed to grow support from more people, and this started in California when we started to really try to move the campaign there, what we started to hear from people was, I agree that this option should be available, but I am offended that you are suggesting that if I don't choose the option that I can't have a dignified death. So people um, didn't want to associate the practice of medical aid and dying with the suggestion that that's the only way to have a dignified death. And so as an organization, we started to define a dignified death or death with dignity as any option that the person wants. Whatever it is that, that you see as a dignified death, that's death with dignity. Medical aid and dying is this particular medical practice. And we have seen um, the names of most of the laws were changed to End of Life Option Act. Like you're seeing um, a growing comfort level um, in understanding um, that, you know, we're not um, telling people that they have to choose this option and that that's what a dignified death is. We simply want the option to be available to people. Great. Um, speaking of definitions, um, one person is particularly interested in knowing how medical schools uh, address medical aid and dying in the curricula and, and, and you know, helping students understand what you were just explaining. Uh, that is a great question, Tom, and I would say that generally speaking, our medical schools are not doing a great job with end-of-life care in general, not just medical aid and dying. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do with our access campaigns, and actually um, this fiscal year, um, we're expanding on this, is to grow, to try to get more medical schools to put this as a part of the curriculum. But curriculum development is really hard. It, it's, it's a long process to get medical schools to add things. They already have a lot on their list. Um, so a lot of it ends up being a part of continuing medical education or happening through the health systems. Um, so the answer is not enough. And if any of the supporters on this call are doctors and want to get involved, we do have very active efforts um, trying to get health systems to adopt supportive policies, trying to get curriculum into medical schools, trying to get um, more CMEs developed. Um, so if anyone on this call would be interested in volunteering in that way, that is definitely um, a need we have and a way that we um, work with um, leader, volunteer leaders. And I want to add to that that uh, you, we've been talking pretty much strictly about medical aid and dying here, but you guys have a whole host of excellent, excellent tools on medical directives, on other options, on what palliative care looks like and how that works with medical aid and dying. And so I just want to underscore that, that I know that Tom dropped Compassion and Choices, the link, and I'll make sure that I put it in the follow-up email as well. But there's a whole bunch of tools that sort of dovetail with this issue that you guys are also just right out on the front with and, and making sure that people are educated about that. Yeah, and Samantha, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Um, and for anyone on this call who has not thought about what you might want at the end of life and filled out your advanced directives, um, we do have a COVID-19 specific toolkit that's on our website um, that really helps you to think through um, would I want to go to the hospital? Could I potentially get oxygen at home? And those answers are going to change depending on your values and priorities and depending on um, kind of your, your health, your health status, um, uh, your sort of what you want will likely change. So I would encourage people to check that out if you haven't given that any thought for yourself. Um, 
one person is is interested in knowing more about um, if whether or not you're interested in focusing um, in addition to medical aid and dying on de-escalation of care. And Sam was just talking about the different um, other possibilities. Um, say that again. The de-escalation of care. So do you mean like unwanted medical treatment? Is that? I think so. Um, I bl um, the person wrote, um, we may also want to focus on withdrawing and de-escalating care. Yes. Okay. I got it. Yeah. So um, we do work um, across um, a range of issues. Our sort of our philosophy is that the patient should be in charge of the care that they receive. Um, and that the patient should have a voice and a choice across the full spectrum of care. Um, we've done a lot of work on, um, and right now within our medical system, the goal of care almost always um, tends to be the extension of life unless you do something to disrupt that. So one of the things that, um, and I wanna be really clear, I'm, we and I am perfectly fine if somebody wants all available treatment options, if they wanna be resuscitated, if they wanna be on machines, like it's not that we take a position that that's a bad thing. Um, the position that we take is that patients should be fully informed and that they should be able to make those decisions. And right now, all too often, the decisions um, are real, people aren't getting full and accurate information about the benefits and the burdens of all available treatment options. So what ends up happening is um, people go in and they are given information and um, that information doesn't let them know that that next chemotherapy treatment that you're about to get really is not beneficial to you and it might result in a, a, a really, really poor quality of life that makes you suffer more. And the likelihood it's going to result in you being saved is like nil. And so part of what we do is to try to ensure that we are helping people to finish strong. My predecessor wrote a wonderful book called Finish Strong, which you could find on our website. And we have a plan your care section that goes through a whole host of um, kind of options for this. And then my, the dementia program that we're doing, um, part of the reason we're focusing on um, treatments around dementia is because when we did a lot of research, what we found was that people had a very hard idea understanding that I might not want medical care, that actually that could be um, worse than not getting, than, get, than taking sort of just pain management. The idea of withholding and withdrawing treatments, it's super difficult for most people to get their arms around, except if you're talking about somebody who's in a state of advanced dementia. People understand what that is. And when they learn that like two out of five people in a state of advanced dementia are getting some form of aggressive treatment in the last month of their life, they're horrified. And so our hope is that by promoting the dementia program and getting people to understand um, just how much care people are getting that may not really be wanted, that will be able to not just impact dementia, but help people to understand the full scope of um, over-treatment that's really taking place, non-beneficial over-treatment. I guess sort of picking up on what you were, off of what you were saying, um, one person asked, does it help if I mentioned my healthcare directive that I want to die with dignity even if I am later not in a position to do it? So um, with medical aid in dying, um, the person always has to be mentally competent. So you're not gonna um, you're not gonna be able to put that down in advance directive and help somebody else carry that out for you. But there are a whole host of other decisions that you want to be sure that you document. Um, and I would definitely encourage you to look at our dementia values and priorities tool. Um, it is, I think. Um, really one of the most um, helpful things that I've seen. You go on to the tool and you answer a series of questions about what quality of life means to you. And, um, and it, so it's things like, you know, if you could no longer um, dress yourself, you know, would you want to continue treatment if you're, um, un if you're unable to recognize your loved one? So it's a whole host of things. And then you can select the level of care that you would want based on those 15 values. Um, and you can also add your own values in and you can combine different things. So for some people, it's like any one of those things is fine, but if I couldn't do 10 of them or three of them. So you can customize. But what most people tell me when they go through it is, wow, like, you've really helped me to understand when people are talking about 
understanding your values and priorities, you've helped me understand what that means. Because the reality is right now for me, um, I would want to be resuscitated. I'm still relatively young. I don't have any, well, I guess relatively young. Some of you don't think I'm young, but in my world, I'm relatively young because we have such an, an older supporter base. And um, I have no health issues. And there's a chance that if I were resuscitated that I could go on and lead a you know, really productive life. And so the decision that you make um, right now might be different than the decision you're going to, or would likely be different than the decision you're going to make in 20 years, or if you have some type of a terminal cancer. Um, so there's a whole host of decisions from resuscitation to do you want to be on life support and how long would you want to be on life support and in what kinds of conditions and would you want to be fed? And those are all things that um, you want to be thinking about at every point in your life. And our values and priorities tool, while it's designed around dementia, it really works for anyone who no longer um, has mental capacity. And it helps you to think about what are those important values and priorities. And I think it, you know, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard conversation that people just don't like to have. And so if you do these medical directives, when you are relatively young and have those conversations with your loved one and whoever might be in charge of making those decisions if you're no longer available to do that, then it makes it easier to have those conversations as you do age and things do become more likely to um, go wrong with your health. And so I think that's an important piece of this is, is that conversation to be had with your, your medical professionals, but also with your family, your loved ones and, and your folks in your life. Yeah. And I'll just add to that, Samantha. Um, it's really, I see it as a gift to the people that are left behind, because what I see all too often is even among our supporters who are active and they're involved in this and they're doing it, um, they will forget to really think about what it is that I want. And the decision of whether or not you take somebody off of a ventilator or whether they get resuscitated, like those are hard decisions in the moment. And the more you've had those conversations and you've really thought through the different scenarios using the values framework, the easier it is for the person that's left behind. Before I came to Compassion and Choices, um, so this was going back now seven or eight years, my dad um, ended up going in for surgery for quadruple bypass surgery. And I walked in, I flew in from, he lived in Florida and, I, and still does, I flew in from um, Maryland to Florida to help um, be there with them. And I walked through the door and he said, here, sign this. And I said, what's this? And he said, you're going to be my healthcare proxy if something happens. And so I signed the paperwork and they wheeled him away. And halfway through his surgery, I turned to my mom and I said, why did dad make me the healthcare proxy and not you? And she said, Oh, because he knew I could never make the difficult decisions. And I said, well, what difficult decisions? And she goes, you know, do you pull the plug or do you not pull the plug? And I was like, well, how am I supposed to know how to make those decisions? And she goes, he just thinks that you'll be less emotional. And I was like, but how do I know what he would want? And she was like, I don't know. He doesn't want to like suffer. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And she's like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm in the waiting room and I'm Googling, you know, when to pull the plug, how to know if someone suffers. He was in his surgery for like nine hours. It was two hours longer than it was supposed to. By the time he got out, I was so angry at him. He gets out of his surgery and I am screaming at him. You are not allowed to die. You wake up and you tell me what it is that you want and then you can die. Like I was just <laughs> crazy. But it was in that moment that I realized that it is a huge amount of pressure to put on your loved ones and not have a conversation with them about it. And these are not easy decisions. Um, so if for no other reason than to make sure that your loved ones are not put in an unconscionable position of having to make a decision that they have no idea what you would want, have, com have those conversations. Even if they're uncomfortable. Even if they're uncomfortable. <laughs> Got any more good ones, Tom, or was that a good place to stop? Um, one more, just one more. Uh, <laughs> one question, how does it, one, oh, there, there are a ton, we haven't gotten, we won't be able to get to all of them, obviously. Um, and actually, that's a question. Uh, for everyone who doesn't have their question answered, how can they reach out to you? Sure. So, um, 
CompassionandChoices.org um, is our website. Go on our website. There's tons of stuff. We also have a webinar series. So you could see there's a Staying Stronger Together webinar series, and um, you can um, can reach out that way. Um, but people can also um, send um, send me an email. It's um, kcallinan, C-A-L-L-I-N-A-N, at CompassionandChoices.org. Um, and um, I'll be happy to answer the question or get you in touch with the right person. Um, the other thing, of course, is to go to our website. If you just simply want to volunteer, is to go to our website, and there's a place there that you can volunteer. And it, a lot of people ask about their their states in particular. Is there a way for them to find out, um, the, you know, the rules in Ohio versus Texas? Yep. So on our website, if you go under Take Action, um, you can click on each state. Um, and we have both the current activity that's in that state, how you can connect as a volunteer, and then there's also information about your local advanced directives and those forms that you, you need to fill out for your state. And the forms are state specific, and some forms, you know, it has to be on yellow paper or pink paper. So you do want to make sure you go to your state website and fill out your state forms. But our values and priorities tool will help you fill those forms out, and it can be an addendum to those forms, which will provide much more valuable information to your healthcare proxy than what is in most advanced directives. They just don't give people enough of the answers. Great. All right, is there anything else uh, either of you two would like to say? No, this is a great group. What really fabulous questions. They, they are usually are... full of a lot of questions. I uh, when I when I start off usually I'm like we probably won't get to all of your questions because there's just always so many from this group, which is great. And so um, I just want to thank you again for coming, Kim, and, and uh, looking forward to hopefully getting back up and running in Maryland and across other states um, across the country. And I do want to mention to the folks on this call, um, I will send out a follow-up email tomorrow with all of these links and all of this information and how to get in touch with us both. And if you want to be involved with your local group, your local secular group, and you think that you're would be interested either in having a speaker come and talk to your group or in volunteering once we are back in session then i will make sure that you can get in touch with with me as well and so thanks again and good night great thank you so much it's a pleasure thanks before we take i uh, get off right now um just want to quickly mention that this is a live recording and it'll be available next uh, tomorrow uh, next Wednesday, we do not have a summer series speech. Uh, instead, on th Thursday at 5, uh, our Vice President Allison Gill will be speaking about the U.S. Secular Survey for the Secular Student Alliance. So if you're bored next week and want something to do, definitely check it out. And then we'll be back again on Wednesday the 29th for a Supreme Court wrap-up. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.